Hi and welcome back to Heimler's History AP Government Edition. In this video I'm going to show you how to write the first three of the free response questions on the new AP Government and Politics exam. And mmm, it's going to be tasty, so let's get to it. So once you've completed the multiple choice section of your exam, you're going to turn the page and you're going to find four free response questions. And that's when you're going to start writing as furiously as a dog trying to bury a turd in a frozen pond. But the fury of your writing is not what will get you the score that you want on these questions, but whether or not you do what they ask you to do. And truthfully, if exam day is the first time you're seeing these questions, you're in for some trouble because they do require a little bit of explanation to really understand how they work and what they're expecting of you. And hey, that's what Heimler's here for. I'm about to splain it up real nice for you. And when you get to the FRQ section of your exam, there will be four of them for you to complete. And I'm only going to deal with the first three. If you want to deal with the fourth one, I've got another video on that, which is linked below. So the first three questions in the FRQ section are kind of like short answer questions. And if you've ever taken AP US history or AP European history, AP world history, you're familiar with this particular format. These three questions on the AP government exam are just like the short answer questions on those exams. The main difference is, is if you're taking one of the history exams, you don't actually know what those short answer questions are going to be about, but not so with the AP government exam. The three questions you get on the AP government exam will fall into three categories. There's the concept application question, the quantitative analysis question, and the SCOTUS comparison question. And SCOTUS just means Supreme Court of the United States. So let me just briefly explain what they're asking for in each one and how you can get a perfect score on each. Each of those three questions will include a stimulus. So there's going to be something to read, or there's going to be a map or a chart, something for you to interpret. And then after the stimulus, there will be three or four questions for you to answer labeled A, B, C, or D. Now you are going to need to write something for these, and they will need to be in sentences, but this is not an essay. You just get in and you get out. There's no need to develop a thesis and body paragraphs or any of that. You just do what they're asking you to do in a couple of sentences and then you're done. So let's get into the examples. It'll be easier to see. All right, the first question that you will always see is the concept application question. In this kind of question, they will give you a scenario to read and then it's your job to relate that scenario to some political principle that you learned in your classes. And that principle can be a political institution, like for example, the presidency or a political process like elections or a political policy like gun control or a political behavior like voting. All right, here's an example. I'll show you how to get a good score on it. Here's the scenario. Consumers complained after EpiPen maker Mylan hiked the price of the emergency auto injector by $100 in recent months for no obvious reason. The price has increased 450% since 2004 when a dose cost $100 in today's dollars to its current price of more than $600. The medication itself isn't that expensive. Analysts calculate that the dosage contained in a single pen is worth about $1. So the scenario is simple. A company called Mylan who makes EpiPens which is a life-saving device, which, by the way, even if you didn't know that, you could guess by the words emergency auto injector, has increased the price of the injector 450% in a few years for no obvious reasons. And consumers are complaining about this because they feel taken advantage of. People who need to carry EpiPens to save their life in an emergency can't stop buying them, so they're forced to pay far more than the medicine is worth. Okay, so now let's look at the questions and see what they're asking us to do with this scenario. A. Describe a power Congress could use to address the comments outlined in the scenario. B, in the context of the scenario, explain how the use of congressional power described in part A can be affected by its interaction with the presidency. And C, in the context of the scenario, explain how the interaction between Congress and the presidency can be affected by linkage institutions. Now for A, B, and C, the points that you earn are binary. You either get it or you don't. There's no shades of gray here. There's no partial credit. It's one point or zero points and nothing in between. Now sometimes one letter can be worth more than one point, but only if it asks you to do more than one thing, and we'll get to that later. But let's just look at this one. Okay, letter A asks you to describe a power that Congress can use to address the EpiPen scenario. Now it's very important that you write about Congress. It's asking you about Congress, not about the Supreme Court, not about the presidency, not about anything else. You have to write about a power that Congress has to address the situation. And the thing is, there's no trickery here. It's actually pretty simple. It asks you to describe a power of Congress. And in AP speak, to describe something means to name it and explain what it means. Now here's where I tell you, there's not necessarily one right answer to all these questions. Sometimes there's a range of right answers and you just need to choose one. So what does Congress have the power to do? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the most obvious one, which is Congress has the power to make laws. So an answer to this question that would get the point is as follows. Congress could draft a bill to enact a price ceiling on the price of EpiPens. Okay, I'm describing and what I just did is named the power that Congress has, the price ceiling, the bill that enacts the price ceiling. Now I'm gonna go on to describe what that is. 
If Congress successfully passed this price ceiling, it would legally cap the price on this life-saving medication and therefore make it more affordable to the people who needed it. And that's it. I just got a point on letter A, so let's move on to letter B. As long as you live in AP world, you're going to have to abide on occasion their unnecessarily confusing language, and B is a perfect example of that. B says, in the context of the scenario, explain how the use of congressional power described in Part A can be affected by its interaction with the presidency. So really all that's saying is that if Congress does what we say they're going to do in letter A, which is, in our case, passing a bill, what can the president do about that? And according to the Constitution, the president really only has two options here. He can sign the bill or he can veto it. So here's an answer that will earn this point. Once the bill for the price ceiling reaches the president's desk, he has one of two options. As the executive, he can sign the bill into law, supposing he supports its contents. However, if he opposes its contents, he has the constitutional power to veto the law. If the president vetoes the bill, Congress has two choices constitutionally. It can rework the bill into something the president will sign, or Congress can override the president's veto with a two-thirds vote. If they are able to muster the override, the bill becomes law without the president's signature. And we just got another point with that answer, so I'm feeling pretty good. Let's move to part C. In the context of the scenario, explain how the interaction between Congress and the presidency can be affected by linkage institutions. So in A and B, we're looking at the interaction between Congress and the presidency, and in this question, we're looking at how linkage institutions can affect this dynamic between Congress and the president. So what I would do at this point is stop for a moment and brainstorm some linkage institutions that I know. We can go with the media, we can go with elections, we can go with political parties, doesn't matter. But for me, I'm going to go with the media this time. Let's see an answer that'll earn the point. Since the president's responsibilities leave him without time enough to read and thoroughly understand every bill that comes across his desk, he must therefore rely on outside sources to form impressions of legislation. Although he has a cabinet of advisors to support him, the president can also be swayed by the media. Supposing the media universally praises the bill being put on his desk, he may be more likely to sign this congressional action into law since he can draw the conclusion that its universal praise indicates support by most Americans. All right, we just answered A, B, and C on the concept application question. Now let's move on to the second kind of question you're going to see, the quantitative analysis question. In this kind of question, you're gonna to have to analyze a quantitative stimulus, which is to say you're gonna to have to look at something and count a bunch of stuff and then say what that counting means. And let's just jump into an example. Okay, let's start by interpreting this image. It's actually pretty straightforward. The title tells us that this map is showing us how much money each state spends on each student enrolled in a public school. And even before we jump into the questions, you can see some patterns. You can see there's a lot more spending in the Northeast than in the Southeast. You can see there's a lot more spending on the East than in the West. Now let's look at letter A and see what they're asking us to do. Identify the most common level of education spending by states in the Southeast. Now, don't overthink this one. When it asks you to identify, that's exactly what it's asking you to do. Just name something. So on this part, if you can count, you'll be fine. So here's an answer that will get the point on part A. The most common level of education spending in the Southeast is $8,000 to $9,999. Oh, how I wish it was more complicated than that, but it's not, that's it. I just did what they asked me to do, done. Letter B, describe a similarity or difference in public education spending by state or region as illustrated in the information graphic and draw a conclusion about that similarity or difference. Okay, now this one's a little more complex than part A. First of all, notice what it's asking us to do. It's asking us to describe. And as I mentioned in the last question, describe means to identify and explain. And then it's asking us for a similarity or a difference and whichever one you choose is up to you. And then they're asking you to draw a conclusion from that similarity or difference that you identify. So in letter B, they're actually asking you to do two things. They're asking you to describe something and then draw a conclusion out of that, which means that letter B is worth two points. Now I'm going to give you an example of both a similarity and a difference. Now you don't have to do both on this in order to get full points. You only have to do one or the other, but just for poops and giggles, I'm going to give you both just to show you how it's done. All right, let's compare states first. I'll choose Texas and Kentucky, and I could choose any of them, but I'll just choose these two. According to the map, both Texas and Kentucky spend the same amount on education per pupil. That's the first part of the answer. The second part is to draw a conclusion on why that might be. Now, don't get confused. There wasn't some part of the curriculum that explained exactly why Texas and Kentucky spend similar amounts in education. And the reason I say this is because you might be tempted at this point to panic because you've forgotten something you were supposed to know for the test. Not true. What they're asking you to do here is to draw a general conclusion about why this might be the case. And so if I knew nothing about the educational politics in Kentucky and Texas, I could still draw the following conclusions. That both 
states probably have similar attitudes towards taxation and government spending on education. And that's it. Now let me try to describe a difference. I noticed that the Northeast looks a lot different than the Southeast on the map. The Northeast spends a lot more on education than the Southeast. That's the identification of the difference. Now let's draw a conclusion. In this case, it's the opposite of the conclusion we drew between Kentucky and Texas. In this case, education spending could be different because both regions have different attitudes towards taxation and governmental education spending. And if you wanted to throw a little sauce on top, though not required, you could mention that in the northeastern states, they tend to be more democratic politically and therefore favor more government intervention in education. On the other hand, southeastern states tend to be more Republican politically and therefore favor less government intervention in education. Okay, that's part B. Let's move on to part C. And part C is where you really need to know your stuff. It says explain how public education spending, as shown in the information graphic, demonstrates the principle of federalism. Now, if you don't know what federalism means, then here you're basically sunk. This is definitely part of the curriculum that a student should have learned. So, federalism as a concept basically means that the power to govern is divided between the federal government and the state's governments. So the federal government doesn't call all the shots and the state governments don't either. They share the power between them. Okay, so the question asks you to explain the difference and that means we're going to need a couple of sentences. So the first sentence, let's show the reader that we know what federalism is. We could say federalism is the concept of the division of power between the state governments and the federal government. And now we need to add another sentence to show how what we wrote in part A and part B demonstrates that division of power. And we could write something like this. And because the map shows that different states spend different amounts of money on education, it means that there is freedom for each state to choose how much it will spend. Because this is true, it indicates that federalism is at work since each state makes its own decisions regarding education spending. Mm, you just got four points on the qualitative analysis question. Now let's move on to the Supreme Court comparison question. Now in the SCOTUS comparison question, they're going to ask you about a case that you don't know. So don't panic, you shouldn't know this stuff. But then they're going to ask you to compare it with a case that you should know, one of the 15 required cases in the AP government curriculum. So if you start reading the case they give you and some panic starts to rise inside of you, don't worry, all is well, you're not supposed to know it. Let me just give you an example. Monthly town board meetings in Greece, New York, opened with a prayer given by clergy selected from the congregations listed in a local directory, but nearly all the local churches were Christian, so nearly all the participating prayer givers were too. A lawsuit was filed alleging that the town violated the Constitution by preferring Christians over other religious groups and by sponsoring sectarian prayers. Petitioners sought to limit the town to inclusive and ecumenical prayers that referred only to a generic God. In the ensuing case, Town of Greece versus Galloway in 2014, the Supreme Court held in a 5-4 decision that no constitutional violation existed. The majority opinion stated that a legislative prayer in this situation lent gravity to public business, reminded lawmakers to transcend petty differences to pursue a higher purpose, reflected values that were part of the nation's heritage, provided a spirit of cooperation, and celebrated the changing of seasons. The audience was primarily lawmakers themselves, and though many bowed their heads during the prayer, they did not solicit similar gestures by the public. It was delivered as a ceremonial portion of the town's meeting. All right, so let's look at part A. It says, identify the constitutional clause, and that's important. It's not asking for an amendment. It's asking for a clause that is common to both Greece versus Galloway in 2014 and Engel versus Vital. Now, just to be clear, the case that you're supposed to know about is Engel versus Vital, but you're not supposed to know anything about Greece versus Galloway. So the Greece case is about clergy-led prayer in a public meeting. And if you'll recall, Engel versus Vital is about teacher-led prayer in public schools. All right, now hopefully it's obvious by this point that the constitutional amendment in question here is the First Amendment. But if you just write that both of these cases have in common the First Amendment, you won't get the point because it's not asking you for the amendment. Again, it's asking you for the clause. So we actually have to dig deeper into the First Amendment and see what clause in there are both of these cases referencing. And in this case, it's the Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion. So in order to get the point for part A, you should write something like this. The constitutional clause common to both Engel versus Vital and Greece versus Galloway is the establishment clause of the First Amendment. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. All right, let's move on to part B. Based on the constitutional clause identified in part A, explain why the facts of Engel versus Vital led to a different holding than the Greece versus Galloway holding. So it's asking you why these two cases had different outcomes even though they're both establishment clause cases. The big difference here is that children in public schools 
schools, while not technically required to participate in the prayer, were forced to listen to a government employee, which is to say a teacher, recite the prayer. And the court ruled that that is an establishment of religion. In the Greece versus Galloway case, it was clergy who led the prayer and the audience was lawmakers. So here's the answer that'll get you a point. The prayers in Greece versus Galloway were not led by teachers, but by volunteers from the community and were part of the ceremonial portion of the meeting. The audience was primarily lawmakers and therefore participation in the prayer was non-compulsory. This is very different from the compulsory nature of teacher-led prayers in public schools. Nailed it. Okay, let's move on to part C. Describe an action that the members of the public who disagree with the holding in Greece versus Galloway could take to limit its impact. So the question is asking, how can people like you and me, like the public, limit the impact of a Supreme Court decision? And there's lots of things the public can do to limit the impact of this decision. They could protest and put pressure on public employees to remove the prayer. They could use the media to convince the rest of the public of their cause. They could vote against the members of the town board in the next election or remove those people who favor the prayer. So all we need to do here is choose one of those and write about it. One way in which the members of the public could limit the impact of this ruling is through protest. By gathering in public and letting the town board know their displeasure, the public can pressure board members to discontinue the practice of prayer before their meetings. And that, my friends, is how you get full points on the first three FRQs in the AP government exam. If you wanna watch my video on how to write the fourth FRQ, the argumentative essay, then I'll link it right here. If you aren't part of our little community here at Heimler's History, then subscribe and come along. I'll catch you on the flip-flop.